Modern medicine is so full of myths, rumours and urban legends, it can be very hard to work out what is real medicine and what is just old wives tales or plans concocted by cunning supplement companies to get you to spend your money. Today we are going to look at 10 of the most common rumours and myths around medicine and see if we can debunk some of the mystique around this weird aspect of health. If you do like the video please subscribe and put a thumbs up because it really helps. Number 10. We only use 10% of our brains. The idea that somehow we've evolved to only use 10% of the capacity of our brain seems somewhat farcical, but it actually originates from a 1908 book by William James, psychologist, who stated we only use a small percentage of our brain. Even holding someone's hand we know crosses at least 10% of our brain's regions, and it's impossible for our brains to use less than 100% of what we've got. The reason we know this is because if you simply don't use part of your neurological function in your brain, it degenerates, which causes dementia, Parkinsonism, various other neurological problems that we would see. And just to clarify, in case we weren't sure if we ever used 100% of our brains, we just have to think about the process of evolution. Evolution has designed a very efficient brain. There is never going to be a system whereby it's created something that we don't use or have a backup or a bit that we hadn't realised we had before. That's not the way evolution works. Our brain is 100% working as it is, and we can't really get any more out of what we've already got. Number nine, eating food before bed makes you fat. This rumor is so well ingrained that it's actually become part of generalized health advice. The theory is that if you eat food just before bed, you're not as metabolically active. So of course you go to sleep, this food isn't burned up, and somehow it then gets stored as fat. Our metabolic drive when we're asleep is actually remarkably similar to when we're awake. Our brain still requires glucose, our body still needs to heal, and our heart still pumps blood around the body. What we're really trying to get people to do is just reduce our total calorie intake, and this is how the technique works. By closing or reducing the amount of calories we eat in the day, this has a greater beneficial effect on our health. Number eight, going out in the cold causes a cold. Many of us as kids can remember being told to wrap up warm when we go outside, otherwise there's a danger we could catch a bug. Of course we used to poo-poo this, thinking this was just overprotective parenting, but there seems to be some data that might prove this correct. For several reasons, we do see people getting more colds and flu-like illnesses in the winter compared with the summer. When we go out in the cold, this causes our veins and arteries to constrict. It is this constriction that stops them acting as effective filters when bugs get up our nostrils. In addition to this, certain types of viruses, in particular rhinoviruses or other ones that might cause a common cold, can also be affected by temperature. They appear to be more active at lower temperatures, but even with these factors taken on board, the biggest reason we see an increased number of coughs and colds in winter is simply hanging around with other people. In the summer, we spend more time outside, air circulates better, and bugs simply can't transfer from person to person as easily. In the winter, we all sit inside, closer environments, huddle around the warmth, and spread each other's disease. Number seven, injecting someone's heart with adrenaline if they're not breathing could save their life. I've seen several movies, including Robocop, Pulp Fiction, even The Rock, which suggest that if you've stopped breathing, an injection of adrenaline into your heart could get things moving again. People do have EpiPens, and it's for acute anaphylaxis for allergies. We never stick it in someone's heart. The heart is surrounded by several layers, including a pericardium and myocardium, which is the muscle layer. If you stick a needle straight into that, not only are you going to damage all the tissue, you're very likely to damage the heart muscle itself, and it's never going to start working again properly. More worrying than this, of course, is how you're going to get to that heart in the first place. Jamming a big needle through someone's chest, you're very likely to hit a lung, which again is going to cause a bigger problem as you've now created air, or worse, blood, into a space that shouldn't have been there. Adrenaline can save people's lives, but you really want to put it into a vein, not into someone's heart directly. That's just prone to disaster. R really just don't do that. Number six, starve a fever, feed a cold. Or is it feed a cold, starve a cold? Starve a fever, feed a cold. I'm not sure. Either way, it makes no difference. This is a really weird urban myth that's coming. One sort of viral illness should be starved, while you should definitely give someone food if they have a different kind. Any sort of viral illness is going to put a massive strain on your immune system. And if it does this, you're going to have an increased calorie requirement. On top of this, if you have a fever or you feel unwell, you're very likely to have an increased fluid requirement because you might be sweating from your temperature. 
If you suddenly take that away by for some reason starving someone, you're gonna make recovery and potential risks of complications even worse. My best advice is I don't, I don't care if you have a flu, a virus, a, a bacteria, make sure you stay hydrated and please eat your food. Number six, drink eight glasses of water a day. The idea that we should be drinking eight glasses of water a day is actually so old it came from a paper in the 1945 American Nutrition Guidance that suggested adults should be drinking 2.5 litres of water a day, hence roughly about eight glasses. About 20% of our fluid we get each day is in food, and of course it doesn't have to be eight solid glasses of water, because squash, tea, and even some dilute forms of coffee still count. So really, it can be quite easy to achieve between two and two and a half litres of total fluid a day. A bigger problem with regards to drinking eight glasses of water a day is the fact that some people take this to extremes. Drinking more than eight glasses of water a day can actually disturb our electrolytes, and by doing this, it can affect our neurological function, causing seizures, loss of memory, and even coma. My best advice is look at your pee. If your pee is light in colour, you're probably drinking enough. And if it's the colour of dark straw or brown, you need to drink some more fluid. Number five, eating five fruit or veg a day is good for you. It is, in a sense, kind of. Well, in reality, this is just a number that was used by health agencies to try and get us to eat more fruit and vegetables, which were generally not very good at doing. 100 years ago, it was harder to obtain easy convenience food. Processing wasn't there, and in general, our diets tended to be healthier. Yes, we died earlier, but this wasn't because of our fruit and vegetable consumption. We know that eating a variety of fruit and vegetables is associated with a range of improved health benefits, including a decreased risk of heart disease and stroke, decreased risk of diabetes, dementia, and various other health benefits aside. But to get those health benefits, does it have to be five? Well, actually no. The number five was the number thought up by various health agencies to try and be an attainable target by the general public. In reality, there is no real upper limit of how many fruit and veg you should eat a day, within reason. I mean, obviously eating 20 oranges a day wouldn't be particularly good for you, especially in terms of just blood glucose levels. But the idea really is that five is the minimum. We want to try and get as much fruit and vegetables to a variety of sources in our diets as possible, and this really does have tangible health benefits. Number four, gluten is bad for you. Gluten is a protein found in various types of wheat, rye, and barley and it acts as a kind of glue. It holds food in certain positions and gives it a characteristic texture and can also add to flavour. For some reason, gluten has become the enemy of many in the health world, arguing that it causes bloating, indigestion and various other medical problems. However, gluten in itself is not harmful, provided, of course, you don't suffer with a medical problem known as celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease affecting the bowel. This means that when patients that are celiac eat gluten, it actually damages the small intestine. For these people that do suffer, it can cause malabsorption problems, including diarrhea, bloating, stomach pain, but also increase the long-term risk of bowel cancer. For this reason, patients that are truly diagnosed as celiac need to avoid eating gluten because it could cause long-term health risks. However, not all people that get the side effects or symptoms of eating gluten are actually celiac sufferers. Time and time again, I see people that say they must be gluten intolerant because when they eat a sandwich, it makes them feel full. I like the feeling of being full when I eat a sandwich and it is probably the effect of gluten that's doing this, but this does not mean that I'm suffering with celiac disease. The key differential is working out whether you have that sensation of bloating or fullness simply by eating bread versus what is a diagnosed medical problem and a true gluten intolerance. For the vast majority of people, eating gluten is absolutely fine. If you wanna feel full, have some food that has gluten in it. Of course, if you're celiac, probably best you don't. Number three, eggs, good or bad? Every few years, I get asked if I'll provide a comment on the safety of eating eggs. And it's strange because there's no real evidence that eating moderate amounts of eggs per week will really cause any adverse health problems. The misconception around eating eggs really comes from the yolk. Splitting the egg into two, of course, the white is very high in albumin and protein levels, whereas the yolk tends to be higher in cholesterol. However, eating a single egg only has 75 calories in it, about 1.6 grams of saturated fat, and it also has multiple amounts of healthy fats, omega-3, 6, and 9, various vitamins and minerals. So in practice, the positive benefits of eating eggs largely outweighs any negatives you might get from the small amount of saturated fat you consume. Overall, it's pretty safe to say you could eat at least three eggs per day and have no real adverse health risks at all. Eggs are pretty good for you. 
Number two, sugar makes children hyperactive. Now this seems like quite a contentious one because we've all been led to believe that when you have sugar, your kids are gonna go crazy. <laughs> oh, those kids. But no, no, there's really very little evidence to suggest that is the case. The reason we tend to associate sugar with hyperactivity really comes down to a misunderstanding between the concept of causation and correlation. The idea that because we see the two things occurring together, they must be linked. However, there's some very interesting studies that looked at whether children actually become hyperactive when you give them lower calorie drinks. Most of the time, the hyperactivity is actually based on the parental behavior. The parents assess how their kids are and they say whether they're hyperactive or not. And in these studies where they gave them low calorie drinks, the parents still said they were as hyperactive as before. We think the real reason sugar is associated with hyperactivity comes down to the time of year and time of events when children are given sugar. So most of the time kids are given sugar at either birthdays, parties, Halloween, Christmas and other times where they might be hyperactive already. This isn't to say that some people may not have specific and very individual reactions to food but in general it's safe to say that sugar itself doesn't make you high. Number one, if you stop exercising your muscle will turn into fat. Amazingly, this theory has actually gained reasonable amounts of credibility and yet it makes no physiological sense at all. So muscle tissue and fat tissue are entirely separate. They're not really linked in any particular way. They are separate structures, just like your bone and your eyes are completely separate structures. And the idea that somehow by not stimulating your muscles, they're going to morph into a different type of tissue doesn't really make sense. However, if you were training very hard and eating a high calorie diet to maintain that muscle and suddenly you stop exercising but eat the same, then those calories are going to go somewhere. The muscle that was there is going to atrophy and generally shrink down, but that calorie intake has to become something and therefore it's going to become fat. So it's not as if we're going to have a direct change whereby muscle becomes fat, but if you stop exercising and you don't adjust your diet accordingly, you'll still put on the weight. Hopefully you found this video enjoyable and maybe even marginally educational. If that is the case, a thumbs up and a subscription would be great. And for more advice and health tips, please go to our website at www.h3health.co.uk.